Bible is one of the most miraculous compilations of 66 books by 40 different authors. It contains history, it contains beautiful narratives, it contains the law, it contains types and symbols, poetry, promises, devotion and doctrine, parables and paradoxes. The Bible also contains prophecy. In fact, 25% or one-fourth of the Bible is prophecy. And God, interestingly enough, in the Old Testament, used 16 prophets, 16 different prophets who wrote 17 different books based on prophecy, where God's unfolding plan and the progressive revelation of His will has been made known to mankind. So these Old Testament prophets, who are they? Somebody describes them as the people with a message where they pour fleshy, uh, molten metal upon the fleshy hearts of people. The words are very powerful, the ones of the prophets. When they walked into villages, if you look in the scriptures, people used to surround them and say, do you come in peace? These prophets did two things. They did foretell and foretell. What does foretell mean? Foretelling means to teach, to warn, to exhort, to comfort through their teaching. That's what foretelling means. They also foretold what's going to happen in the future. It's not a prediction, mind you. It's a promise of events that are going to happen in the future. These are the uh, prophets who declared the kingdom of God, the Messiah is going to come, some events that are going to happen in people's lives. And the people who are going to be affected by those events, that's the foretelling that is involved in the life of a prophet. And one such prophet, his name is Isaiah. And by the way, prophets never bought prophets. With me? Prophet, prophet. Does it sound the same? Sorry, that's Indian English, okay? Prophets never bought prophet, okay? This prophet, one prophet, remarkable prophet, is by the name of Isaiah. And he wrote a book called Isaiah, right? And this book is considered to be one of the most remarkable books ever written because you see in the Bible there are 66 books, 39 Old Testament, 27 New Testament. And Isaiah has 66 chapters in total, equal to the number of the books, and they call the scholars call it Bible within the Bible. So what is the 40th book in the Bible? Anybody? Quick, sharp, you guys. 39th book is Malachi. 40th book is Matthew. So let's see if there's any kind of correlation between the 66 chapters of Isaiah and the 66 books of the Bible. Interestingly enough, the scholars say every chapter in the book of Isaiah is related to a book in the Bible. For example... If you look at the 40th chapter of Isaiah, equivalent to the beginning of the New Testament, you know what he says in verse 3? He says, the voice of the one calling in the, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. How does the New Testament begin? Begin with, begins with John the Baptist Preparing the way for the Lord. Interestingly, the 40th chapter in Isaiah starts with preparing the way of the Lord. The prophecy is given. But even more remarkable is this one chapter in Isaiah called Isaiah chapter 53. It's considered to be the holy of holies in the, in the Old Testament. It's so significant. Why is it so significant? Because 700 years... Before Jesus Christ came to this earth and he died for the sins, all the details of his life, how Christ would look in his flesh, the extremes he would experience towards the end of his ministry, his suffering, his death, are all recorded prophetically in Isaiah 53, 700 years before Christ came. This chapter is so controversial to the Jewish people who stick to the Old Testament, that they carefully eliminated this chapter, some of them, and some of them don't even want to talk about the distance themselves from Isaiah 53. 
I went to um, the hospital once to pray for somebody. I went to the chapel downstairs just to see the Tanakh, the Jewish Bible. And I wanted to see what they thought about Isaiah 53. I looked at it and said, Christians believe this points to Christ. We don't believe that way. That's what it says on top of it. So Isaiah 53 is one of the most provocative, dramatic, specific chapters in the Bible that points to Christ. So when the Jewish people had this trying to snub this chapter. In 1947, an amazing thing happened. The Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in the Qumran Caves in the Galilean region in Israel, 1947. And they found the whole book of Isaiah in one of those clay jars that includes Isaiah chapter 53. What is special about this chapter? What can we learn? Well, see, uh, it actually begins in Isaiah 52, the last few verses, and then it continues into 53, because chapter divisions in the Bible were never in existence until the 14th century. You know, the whole thing was like one manuscript, but until the 14th century, we didn't have, let's read from Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. We never had those before. It came in the 14th century. So it actually starts from 52, verse 13, and this is what it says. Behold, my servant, talking about Christ, shall deal prudently, he, will, he shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. It's talking about Christ, Isaiah prophesies and says, He will be exalted and extolled and he'll be dealing very prudently, very wisely in his mission. So what does this word exalted and extolled mean? Was Christ ever exalted during his lifetime on earth? No. He was humble servant and people, some people received him, some people rejected him. Some people didn't, uh, can't, couldn't wait to see him die. So what does this exalting and extolling mean? The word extol means to lift up. Christ was lifted up, raised up. What does that mean? Well, Christ, in his conversation with Nicodemus in John chapter 3, says, as Moses lifted up a serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. He's talking about himself. Christ is saying, I need to be lifted up like the serpent in the wilderness. What happened in the wilderness? Let's look at that passage. See, so Israelites, they came from Egypt, <clears throat> and because of the rebellion, something happened. This is what the Bible says. Then they journeyed from Mount Or on the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. The soul and the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. So the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food, no water. Our soul loathes this worthless bread. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people and many people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord against you. Pray to the Lord that he would take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord tells Moses this. The Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent, set it up on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent, put it on a pole, so that it was... Um, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. Strange story, isn't it? Strange story, absolutely weird, peculiar thing. So here are these people rebelling, and the snakes bite them, and they're dying. And God gives them a solution. He said, Moses, make a bronze serpent, lift it up. Whoever looks at it, when they're bitten, they shall live. How is this important? Serpent signifies sin. Serpent signifies, the brass serpent signifies the judgment of God. And when people are looking at the serpent, they are living. How does this portray Christ? How does Christ, how is Christ fit into this profile? The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. Christ became sin on the cross. He didn't carry sin. He became an object of wrath 
of God's judgment on the cross. That's what has happened. That's what is symbolic of the serpent and Christ being lifted up. So Christ was raised up. Christ was exalted so that you and I can look at this man who took the sin upon himself and we can live. You see the picture there? How beautifully it comes together that hundreds of thousands of years before Christ came, the same symbolism existed then. And this was prophesied by Isaiah that he'll be exalted. And then he continues saying, Isaiah says, Just as many were astonished at you, so his visage was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of man. His visage was marred, means his appearance was marred more than any man. Translators kind of soften uh, this scripture. In the original Hebrew, you know what it says? Christ on the cross didn't look anything like a human being. He was so marred, so out of shape in his appearance, he was unrecognizable. This is what Isaiah was prophesying. Remember, 700 years in advance, the suffering and the death. Then he continues this way. Isaiah chapter 53, this is where we enter. He says, Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of the dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the only place in the Bible where you have the physical description of what Christ looked like when he was on this planet. There was nothing in him that one should desire him. He was a real human with real skin, with real nerve endings, and he sweat in the hot sun in the Middle East. He was a man who was stung by sharp words. There were tear glands in his eyes, and he was weeping on a few occasions. Words hurt him. But what happened to this Jesus, sadly, if you look at this description, there's nothing attractive about him, but they didn't stop people from being creative about how he would have looked like. And you have ridiculous amount of paintings that show him as a blonde-haired man with blue eyes and absolutely beautiful, attractive man. And the Bible says there's nothing about him that anybody should desire him. There's nothing in him that makes people want to walk with him. There's nothing in the physical dimension, in the physical realm, that is appealing to man. That's how Christ came. In fact, he's described as a shoot out of the dry ground. What does that mean, shoot out of the dry ground? Well, if you look in the Middle East, dry ground means a lot. If you go to Israel, this is pretty much Israel. Dry, absolutely dry. It's a picture. It's a setting of the scripture. And this is where Christ came as a shoot out of the dry ground. Barren landscape, miles unending. So in order to understand the scripture, a shoot out of the dry ground, we got to go back in time. When Israelites were walking through the wilderness, <clears throat> there's nothing there for them. There's complete barrenness with this utter dependence on God and God alone for their provision. There is no way they can cultivate anything. They're walking as a nation. Imagine the scenario. And the once in a while you see trees here and there, but there's one tree that I want you to, or I want to point out to. It's called the acacia tree. The shoot out of the dry ground. In the whole the barrenness, there are a few trees here and there and shrubs. There's one tree that sticks out called the acacia tree. It's a hardwood tree. And it grows for hundred and hundreds of years. It's a very slow-growing tree. It's known to be the most valuable tree to the Bedouins today and for the people in the past. What's special about it? Number one, you can stand under this tree, and the people say one tree is equivalent to five air conditioners. In the hot Middle East, the moment you stand under a tree, you feel cold. It's a place of shade. <clears throat> so acacia was used for shade. Not only that, when the dead and dry branches fall off, 
They can be used for firewood and apparently it burns for a long time because it's a hardwood tree. And there are pods that it gives that one kilo of them, if you boil them, can be used uh, as food for camels for almost a week. And there's some tiny leaves that the camels and some goat uh, feed on. And there's something else that this tree does. If you cut it, if you hurt this tree, apparently it bleeds. And it gives something like a gummy substance, which when you boil, can be used as medicine. So you can use that for stomach ailments, skin conditions. And there's a various, so as you can see, this tree has multiple purposes. But what is the biblical significance of this tree? Well, this is the tree the Israelites used to build the tabernacle. All the wood, if you read the scriptures in Exodus and everywhere, they used acacia tree to make those planks, to make the posts, to even make the Ark of the Covenant. And it's coated with gold. So acacia tree is a tree that could be useful in multiple ways. What is this wood in the tabernacle symbolic of? It's symbolic of the humanity of Christ. Christ came as a root out of the dry ground. The whole essence of the tree is sacrificial. In its death, it's giving, similar to Christ. In humanity, there's nothing that could draw people to him. Just like the tabernacle in the wilderness, if you look at, look at it from the outside, it's absolutely non-appealing. It's covered with skins and this pores, and there's nothing appealing about it until you go into the inside. It's filled with gold, the altar of incense, the table of showbread, the menorah, the ark of the country. It's covered with gold, brilliant gold. From the outside, it's not appealing. From the inside, it's full of beauty, exactly like Christ Jesus. In his physical appearance, there is nothing ap appealing about him. There's nothing attractive about Christ during this lifetime. My friends, I want to make a quick note here. Christian industry today is trying to make Christ appealing. They try to make him like a superstar and create a big sensationalism around Christ on the physical realm. The way you can recognize the beauty of Christ is only in the spiritual, not in the physical. So we need to know that you cannot entertain people into the kingdom of God. You need to know it's a work of the Holy Spirit that transforms lives. When churches use worldly means to achieve spiritual goals, they're in a big jeopardy. They're in huge, huge danger. There's nothing about Christ that is relevant in the flesh. It's not Jesus in flesh. Yes, he did the act, but we need to remember in the spiritual, he's the son of the most high God. That's what he wants us to recognize him by. He wants us to see him as the one creator who created the ends of the earth. For of him and through him and to him are all things made, even principalities, powers, and everything is made by him. That's the Christ we need to look at. In the physical realm, there's nothing to be drawn to Christ. In the spiritual, is beyond phenomenal. He's the son of the Most High God. And if we strive to make this Christ glamorous during our lifetime on this earth, my friend, we are failing. Because, you know what the Bible says, Isaiah continues to say, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. The words that are used are very powerful here. He was despised, meaning regard something as worthless. Christ in the physical realm was negligible and a worthless man. He was scorned. Israel, Israelites didn't want this one to be the Messiah. He was scorned. They ignored him and treated as if he didn't, doesn't exist. You know, criticism is not the greatest insult. You criticize somebody is not the greatest insult. 
to insult, the highest form of insult is treating that person as if he doesn't exist. That's even worse. In criticism, at least you talk to the individual. But to ignore a person and treat him as if he doesn't exist, imagine the pain. Imagine the scars that are not visible that Christ had to endure. The real wounds are deep, the invisible. In the eyes of men, he was rejected, he was despised, he was scorned. Nobody esteemed him. So why did he come anyway? What's the purpose? What is his mission? Isaiah continues to describe his mission. Surely he has borne our, borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, afflicted. For he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our, for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. The mission of Christ is very well described by Isaiah in the scriptures. See those words. Griefs, sorrows, stricken, smitten, afflicted, pierced through, crushed, chastening, scourging. Despite his majesty, despite his unquestioned majesty, despite his glory, never ever think Christ came to this earth as a superhero. He didn't. He came as a suffering servant. He came as a one despised, to, 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 as a broken man, as a man who was bleeding for the hearts of people, as a lamb of God to the slaughterer. There's nothing in him that appealed to him. So we cannot try to make him somebody he's not. He came on a mission, and this is what is required. This mission is what the Father gave him, and he pursued that mission. Can you imagine the contrast and the diversity of who this Christ is? The God, the creator of the ends of the earth, became a man and he was treated this way. Talk about extremes. The greatest being, <laughs> God, the creator. I keep repeating this again and again. The Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. That's Christ Jesus, the ancient of days, the one who was there before Abraham. That Christ was this when he came to earth. Chastised, despised, rejected, pierced, crushed. Did the people know who they were dealing with? What kind of humility do we see? In this man. That's why he says, come to me, I'll teach you. For I'm humble and lowly at heart. Even though he was equal with God, Bible says he did not consider equality with God, made himself of no reputation. You know why he did that? Because you and I were on his mind. You know why he did that? Because he loves us beyond anything. That's why he did that. So what happens? Isaiah continues to say, share, and he says this. All we, that's us, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The sin of every human being, past, present, future, was laid upon this one man. It starts with all, ends with all. He's all in all. Here is the gospel for you. Isaiah recorded the gospel right there. So we like sheep have gone astray. Christ paid the price. He took it all upon himself. How did he do it? His mission. How did, how, how did he do it? You know, to die for the sins of the entire human race is not an easy thing to go through. Especially Christ is in his humanity. And many times he was talking to his disciples and he said, you know, the Son of Man will be betrayed and he'll die on the cross. The disciples didn't get it. What is he talking about? You're going to die? I thought you came to be the king. What are you, what are you talking about, death? Christ wasn't hesitant. Uh, wasn't hesitant. He talked about, about the suffering that lay ahead. He made many times, he made those remarks. Even in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was crushed. And he was saying, Lord, if it's your will, let this cup pass from me. He was struggling in his flesh. But yet, Bible says, he was oppressed and afflicted. 
yet he opened, na- opened not his mouth. Oppressed means pressed hard to be driven, plagued, hard pressed. Afflicted means to be made low forcefully into submission. They did all that to him, and yet he didn't open his mouth. This is not to conjure up an emotional sentiment as to what Christ has done. I'm not trying to talk about this to, oh, poor Christ, no. I want you to see in the spiritual realm the significance of the mission he came for and how much you and I are value, valuable in his sight and what he had to go through for it. And then he continues to say, he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before his shearers is silent, so he opened out his mouth. Shearing the wool is one thing. Sometimes the shepherds have some fight on their hands. When it comes to slaughtering, the sheep are very passive, it seems. Christ anticipated the mission. And for the joy that is set before him, he endured this. He just went silently. Can you imagine this? He had you and I on his mind and is being carried away for all this process. And Isaiah 53, 8 says, For he was taken from prison from judgment, and who will declare, who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people, he was stricken. The word cut off means killed in Hebrew language. But it could also mean cutting a covenant. To, through his death, same word, karath, is used, is also cutting a covenant, making an agreement through the shedding of his blood. Genesis 9, 11 says, God says, I will establish my covenant, same word used, cut off, with you, that neither sh- shall all flesh be cut off anymore by the waters of the flood, neither shall be any more uh, be the flood to destroy the earth. Same word. The covenant, the death and the covenant, they go together because without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. You with me so far still? And then it continues to say in Isaiah 53, 9, he says, And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death. Strange scripture. 700 years before Christ actually came, Isaiah says, They made the grave with the wicked. Yes, Christ died on the cross among two criminals. Never ever have an understanding with the religion today that Christ died among two candles in a cathedral. Okay, don't ever get into that mode. He died among two criminals on the cross, the wicked. But in the grave, he was with the rich. If you remember the story, Joseph of Arimathea, a Pharisee, it was his grave that was used to put the body of Christ in. And if you go to the garden tomb in Israel today, they, found, they think they found the grave in which Christ's body was laid. And right next to it is a massive cistern. <clears throat> cistern is a, one who owns a cistern is an indicator during those days that he was a rich man. So that grave or the tomb in which his body was put belonged to a rich man. But when he died, he died with the wicked. And Isaiah wrote that in advance. And then he continues to say, because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. First Peter 2, 23 and 24, Peter recalls the same thing, but it, this is how it describes. Who, that is talking about Christ, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins, on his own body upon the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. How beautiful is this submission of Christ. Can you imagine? How wonderfully he leaned on the plan of the Father. He submitted and committed himself to the one, his Father, who judges righteously. After Isaiah writes all this, he makes one of the most astonishing statements. I consider this to be the most astonishing, powerful statement in the Scripture. And this is what the Bible says. And yet, 
It pleased the Lord to bruise him. It pleased the Father to bruise the Son. How do we wrap our mind around this statement? It's very bold. How can a father be pleased with the son being crushed? How can a father find satisfaction in the death of his son? How can we understand this? I'll illustrate this by taking you through a small story that I came across. I think this could make some sense. This is actually a true story about a man named John Griffith. In the 1930s, John Griffith worked as a huge uh, railroad bridge controller. So this bridge is the one that opens when it's, uh, it's up upon the river called Mississippi. So whenever the ships come, the barges come, this bridge, John used to press those buttons and the bridge goes up and the ships go through. And that's what his job was. A responsible job. <clears throat> and also, when he shut the bridge, the trains used to go past it, and there's a, a schedule on which these trains run, and John Griffith was familiar with this. In 1937, one day John Griffith took uh, his 80-year-old son to experience what his daddy does. So he took him to work for the first time, and the boy was super excited to see what his daddy does is all these levers, buttons, bridges, boats passing through. He was all excited. Wonderful. He had lunch with him on the observation deck and time was passing by. John was so caught up in his son and he's so excited. He was sharing with him a story. And all of a sudden, in a distance, he hears the whistle or the shrieking of a train coming their way. John all of a sudden realized, wait a minute, it's time for the train to, what's the time? It's 107. It's time for the train to pass over the bridge, and the, the bridge is open right now. I got to bring it down. So he realizes the Memphis Express with 400 passengers that comes every day across this, roaring across this bridge. So John was not anxious. He quickly ran without panic and leaped into the control office and and did the necessary, made sure there are no ships coming through the river. And just when he was about to push the lever to bring down the bridge, his eye caught something. He saw the son who was standing on the observation deck all of a sudden slipped and fell into the chamber where the gears were. His leg was caught, and the, the son was still alive, but his legs was caught in those gears, and the time train was coming. And John, when he looked at it, panic began to fill his heart. He could go down with the rope, lower himself down, pick his son, come back again. But the train is very fastly approaching. John began to panic. It's a moment of decision. He's in the control tower. They knew there's no way he could go down, rescue his son, close the bridge so that the train could pass. The train was getting closer and closer. The, the bridge has to be closed, but if he closed, pushed that lever down, his son would truly be crushed and truly be killed. His son caught in the gears, train coming towards the bridge, could hear the sound. What could John do? There are 400 people on the train. Every day he used to let this train go. He, He's kind of familiar with the train, 400 people. Choice between those 400 people versus his one son who's stuck in the gears. John buries his head in the sleeve. With a heavy heart, he pulls the gear. The massive bridge is lowered. Memphis Express goes upon it, and the people sitting in the train have no clue what just happened. John cries out in pain. People on the train are completely oblivious to what has happened. They're doing their own thing, living their own lives, reading their newspapers, sipping coffee. 
And as the train goes by, John runs to the place where his son was. And he says, I sacrificed my son for you. The Son of God was sacrificed so that you and I can have eternal life. That's why the Bible says, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. God not only forgives us, saves us, heals us, delivers us through the death of his son. And he abandons him to the shame and slaughter so that you, he can receive you and I. And we can become his sons and daughters. He can receive us. If, the, if this statement doesn't tell us how much God loves us, I don't know what else would. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9 and 10, it says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him, for whom all things, and by whom all things, in uh, whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, make it to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. God loves you and I so much, it seems, He had to let go of His Son and let Him die so that He can receive you and I. If you are having questions this morning about whether God still loves you, this is it. If you are thinking this morning as a young person, nobody values me anymore in this world, let me tell you, in God's sight, you're of extreme importance. Would Jesus have done the same? Would God the Father have, would have done the same? It was just you alone on this planet? I think he would. The reason why? Because the Bible says God is love. God doesn't have love. He is an embodiment of love. And because of his nature, he cannot let anyone perish, including yourself. And during this time of your life where you're thinking, why has God abandoned me? You think God has abandoned you? He abandoned his son 2,000 years ago so that he can never leave us nor forsake us, Bible says. Don't you ever think for a moment that you're left all alone once you give your life into the hands of God. He's a Lord who is never going to leave you. If you say this morning, Lord, how much do you love me? Do you love me at all? God the Father will say, look to the cross and see what I have done with my son so that I may possess you as my own son and daughter. All you have to do, my friends, to know how much God loves you is look to the cross. Look to the cross. Isaiah starts by saying, who has believed our report? Are you the person who believes in what Christ has done this morning? Are you still struggling whether this is a real thing that God really cares for you. This is really a true thing that has happened in history. Of course, there's historical, scientific, prophetic evidence again and again. 700 years before Christ came, this was very well recorded about this man who came in history. I'll conclude with this one, one um, beautiful song that a man wrote. He says in that song, The man of sorrows, what a name. For the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim. Bearing shame and scoffing rude, in my place condemned he stood. Sealed my pardon with his blood. Guilty, vile, and helpless we, spotless Lamb of God was he. Full atonement, can it be? And then he concludes by saying, Hallelujah. What a Savior. Everybody say, Hallelujah. What a Savior. Isn't that wonderful?